We're ready to continue our presentations. And our next speaker is Brian Wiley from Kitware, and he is presenting Data Analysis, Machine Learning, Bro, and You. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, hope, uh, hopefully, everybody had a good lunch. Uh, so, I'm from Kitware. Uh, so Kitware does a lot of open source software. If you've ever used CMake, you've used Kitware software. Um, they uh, have about 130 employees. They've been around for 25 years. Um, somehow they've made a business out of doing open source. And uh, so, so I was extremely attracted to the company. Um, I have a background in information security and visualization. Uh, and so it was a great fit. Um, so, and I also love mixed corgis. So it's you know it's the big dog and the little in the corgi package. It's just adorable. <laughs> All right. So what is the point of this talk? Um, so uh, you know I've I've been doing d data science and data analysis and machine learning uh, kind of off and on depending on my job and my tasking. Um, it it always seems a little more difficult than it should be. Um, you know, there, what, one of the movements that's happening in data analysis and machine learning is what I call commoditization, right? So people are getting better about packaging them up and then, okay, here's a tutorial, here's how you run it, um, and, you know, in five lines of code, you can, you can run the thing. So, so I, we really wanted to kind of do that here, right? So uh, we are, we're excited about Bro or whatever it's going to be called. We're excited about the community. Um, and you know, we, we really wanted like, okay, cool. We're looking at bro data. You know, how do we how do we quickly cross uh, those bridges and make it easy? So, um, in particular, uh, and I'm going to talk about these the different toolkits. But so pandas is a popular Python toolkit. So going from a bro log to a pandas data frame is literally one line of code. Uh, you just so you download pip install. Uh, BAT, so BAT is the Bro Analysis Toolkit. Um, you write this one line of code, and you have a pandas data frame, um, and all of the all of the kind of details uh, around type conversions um, and indexing and all those things are kind of taken care of for you. So, you know, the Bro log is basically a self-describing type, uh, and so we don't we don't have any hard-coded schemas in the software. We simply go and inspect the bro log, look at its type, do all the right conversions uh, over to Python types, and then that's what, how we populate the pandas data frame. OK, so uh, what's the intended audience? So obviously, people who like Python, um, people are, who are interested in these uh, you know, data analysis and machine learning toolkits, uh, people who hate uh, seeing examples with the iris data set um, or, or word frequency counts, right? So that seems to be kind of what everybody does for these examples. Um, and it can be kind of frustrating when you try to use it on, on your own data. You know, I have a DNS log. That DNS log has lots of, you know, has query types. It has error codes. It has numerical fields, right? How do I take all that data and how do I use it in kind of a meaningful way uh, with some of these toolkits? Uh, so we're going to cover a lot of stuff. Um, you know, we're going to kind of do a deep dive on the pandas uh, and scikit-learn. We're even going to do some live coding, which is always fun slash terrifying. Um, so uh, we're going to talk about uh, Kafka and Parquet and Spark, and see that so Kafka is a is a real-time messaging queue. Parquet is a high-performance. Uh, on disk format, and then Spark is a kind of like a streaming, uh, it's a memory-oriented Hadoop kind of, kind of ecosystem. So, but we're not, gonna, we're not gonna kill kind of on the last part of, of that. Uh, so there's a, there's a great talk uh, tomorrow at 3.30. So uh, I've, seen, I've seen, you know, Eric Dahl and others, I've seen some of the work before, and it's really excellent, and they have huge data. So, uh, so I'm just going to I'm going to touch on it just from a kind of pragmatic point of view, but I definitely recommend going to uh, tomorrow tomorrow's talk. 
All right, uh, so software bridges. You know, how do you get from here to there? How do you get from, from bro data to Python? How do you get from bro data to pandas or scikit-learn? Um, so I'm going to talk about these different bridges, uh, and then I'm going to kind of uh, give, a, give an example use case. Like, oh, we want to do anomaly detection with clustering. You know, how do we do that, uh, given, the, given the software we've talked about? So uh, we, have, we have kind of a different high-level diagram for what, how we use Kafka and, and Spark and, and our Parquet. But for, for Pandas and Scikit-Learn, this is what it looks like. So uh, a data frame is, uh, if people are familiar with R, um, or, uh, the, the R has a data frame concept. And I hate to say it this way, but it's kind of like an Excel spreadsheet. So you have a column name, and then you have a, and then you have a column of data. Um, and the way data frames are oriented is it's called column R storage. So that column of data is, is laid out in memory in a highly efficient way. They can, you can run kind of vectorized operations on it. It has to be single typed. So I can have one column that's float and one column that's int and another column that's string. But the column itself has to have a hom homogeneous type. Um, and then those columns uh, are often stored as NumPy arrays. And so NumPy is kind of this low-level uh, Python library um, that, that has kind of these highly efficient mathematical kernels that, again, will do these, these vectorized operations. So, uh, you know, kind of on this, kind of on the, on the, this side of the, oops, sorry. So here, you know, you have a lot of these data frame operations, and we'll talk about that. Um, here, you know, uh, and, and this is kind of like where pandas lives. So the, if you go and look at the pandas Python module, that's, that's where a lot of that stuff lives. And then here uh, is where the scikit-learn um, stats models, things like that. They all, they all use these NumPy arrays. Um, and so we'll be talking about both of those. Okay. Uh, so software bridges. So uh, I don't know what I'm going to call it when the, the name changes, but for now it's the bro analysis tools. So uh, you simply pip install bat, um, and, and you're off and running. Um, th that's it. There's no additional dependencies or requirements. Um, the, it's hosted on GitHub. Uh, it's completely open source. It's Apache 2, if you're, if you're interested. Um, and again, supported by, by a company that makes its living off of doing open source. OK, so uh, let's, let's just take a quick look at, at that repository. I just, I just want to orient people. By the way, you know, I'd love, uh, we won't slow it down, but if people want to play along and, and pip install bad and stuff, uh, you know, uh, go ahead. Um, it should be straightforward. Um, the, the GitHub repo is here. Uh, it has 49 stars. I would hate to see that go to 50 because 49 is 7 times 7. So please don't, please don't. Just leave it. All right. Um, okay, so that's, that's where you can get it. Uh, and again, you don't even need to look at the repo. You can just pip install. Uh, but there's tons of examples. So, you know, we're going to go through some of these. Um, you know, we have. You know, Kitware, again, is a kind of like open source, and they're really kind of retentive about, hey, make sure you have all these nightly tests and you have all these coverage. Um, uh, great examples, and then notebooks on everything. So, you know, we even, we, we even have things like, oh, you want to choose the, the K hyperparameter for clustering. You know, oh, here's how to do that, right? Um, uh, I'm going to talk about mostly kind of data analysis and machine learning today, but this actually has a bunch of other stuff. So, you know, if you want to run Yara SIGs on extracted files and not have Bro slowed down by doing that process, you can just you run a script here and you kind of offload that. Um, and so we have a lot of examples around like checking, checking certificates, uh, you know, dynamically making virus total queries, you know, all, the, all those kinds of things. Okay. Okay, so the first one here uh, is just like, okay, First bridge is I want to go from a bro log to Python. Um, so uh, you just you instantiate a bro log reader. 
you give it the log you want, um, and that yields a generator. So I don't know how, how familiar people are with Python, but, but in Python you can, you can yield uh, a generator, and that's, that's basically will yield one row at a time, and it means that you're not, you don't have to read the whole file, and so it just simply like streams the file to you. So this will handle extremely large log files. Um, and so here you're just in a while loop, and, and then you can do whatever you want with the row. Um, and you can see uh, that kind of the, all of the details around type types are handled. So, you know, if it's an interval type in bro land, then it becomes kind of the right time delta here in, in Python land. Um, and, you know, please feel free to ask questions as we go. Okay, uh, so that's, that's bro to Python. And then how do you get into pandas? Um, well, first of all, what is pandas? So pandas... Uh, you know, kind of high-level, very expressive uh, Python package developed by Wes McKinney. So Wes is involved in projects like Arrow uh, and Pandas, and he also does uh, some Parquet work and, and is engaged within this kind of Spark community. So Wes is uh, involved kind of at some level in all of those projects. Um, so this is going to be a demo, and demos are always a little bit like, ah, all right, so let's, uh, we'll take a little breather here, and hopefully it'll go okay. All right, uh, quick poll of the audience. Uh, how many people are familiar with IPython, Jupyter Notebooks? All right, I'm going to say one-third. Okay, so um, the... Don't, don't let the, uh, the Jupyter Notebook fool you. This is really just Python code. So Jupyter Notebook is kind of this nice combination of presentation plus code. So, you, so it actually has these kernels behind it, and you can evaluate Python or Julia, or they have these different language backends. Um, and so they have a different kind of markdown. So here, like, you know, I can, oh, this is the bro PNG here. And so I can, I can do a little markdown, and then, you know, kind of the obvious thing, thing three. Um, so that's nice. And what people will do is they'll make a little markdown cell, and then they'll do some Python, and then discuss it. So, okay, so here we, we'll start, you know, I've, I've done my pip install bat, uh, and then we will simply import the, the code. So you have the log to data frame. And then I say, okay, I'm going to pull in my, my uh, DNS log. And if people are interested, the, the data, you can grab this data set. So this is from Sec Repo. Um, the, it, it didn't actually have the headers on it. So, so we included the headers and, and kind of put, posted them back up. So Kitware, there's a data.kitware.com. So you can just go to that. You can go to collections, uh, scroll down to infosec data and bro IDS. And then there's a bunch of kind of like big bro logs here. This, this is from, uh, there, was a, there was an MAC uh, contest uh, and collection in 2012. And so the, these are all from that. OK. Uh, so back to the live demo. All right, so that's it. So now if, I, uh, if people are familiar with pandas, if I do a head, um, it'll show me like the first five rows in that pandas data frame. Um, and so you can see here that the, so I've read in my data, uh, the, the properly indexed now by, by timestamp, and I have all my fields, right? So, um, so let's, you know, what are the kinds of operations you can do with, with that? I mean, first we can look at the number of columns. Um, here, like we just do some value counts, like, oh, I'm gonna look at the, the protocol. Okay, well, most of it's the normal, you know, 427,000 of those with a normal UDP, and then there was some TCP traffic uh, for DNS. Um, same thing with, with kind of like query type names, I can look at the distributions associated with, oh, what are the different query types in that, in that pandas data frame. So this is kind of cool, and this is an example of a vectorized operation. So here, I'm just saying, okay, take the field called query uh, from my bro log, uh, convert that to a string, take the length of that, and then store that in a new column called query length. Right? So I run that vectorized operation. Um, I, oh, let's see, 
me add a new cell here. DNSDF.head. All right, so then, ah, so I'm there and on the very end, I now have this thing called query length. So very easy to add a column. Uh, and again, you know, that, was a, that was like a half a million uh, rows and it happened almost instantaneously. Um, okay, I, I can also do a describe. So describe will give me um, a set of statistic, uh, statistics associated with all the different numerical fields. So you know, kind of the standard uh, kind of mean and standard deviation and then all the quartiles. Um, the, uh, so we can plot. So uh, here I can say, okay, well, I've computed a new field called query length. Show me that box plot, right? Um, and so here, I don't know if people are familiar with box plots, but, but this is basically the, the first quartile. So 25% of the data happens from here to here. The remaining 25% happens here. This is the median, so the, 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 you know, the, the one point right in the middle, and then next quartile, last quartile, and then outliers. So, uh, so this, this will automatically identify outliers uh, from a statistical sense, right? So here you can see, oh, well, some of the query lengths were, were long, right? And we might want to investigate, well, why is that? Um, so, so filtering. So this is the other nice thing you can do. So, so exactly what I said. I'm like, oh, well, why are these these long queries? You know, let me show me all the queries that are greater than 80, right? So I just did that little filter. I applied it, and then I the head just shows me the number of rows. So here we can see all of the DNS queries that were longer than 80, right? And I don't know if I'm threat hunting or something. That that, that may be that may be interesting to look at. Um, pretty easy to do histograms, so I just compute a histogram. Uh, you know, if I wanted to, like, oh, you know, maybe it's kind of like hidden here off the end, so I can just say log equals true. All right, and then now my histogram is a log, right? I can say, oh, what, what's going on in this end? Uh, you can also kind of like embed uh, calculations. So here, uh, someone told me that entropy was cool. It has something to do with expanding universe. Um, and so I can compute the entropy associated with the queries, because like maybe the query is like embedded data or something, and that data will have higher entropy. Um, so maybe it's like a DNS tunnel. Um, and then I, can, then I can just look like, oh, okay, well, okay, what, given entropy and query length, you know, what's the, what's the correlation here? So, um, so here, if I just type correlation, it kind of gives me this, this huge matrix. It says, oh, here's every variable correlated to every other variable, right? Um, which can be overkill, so here we can just say, okay, well, show me, show me just, give me just these two fields, the newly computed entropy field, the query length, and then are those correlated? And, and there's different methods of correlation. Here I'm using Spearman. Spearman is a rank-based correlation, so it'll kind of, it'll, it, it'll help kind of with non-linearities, right? So, um, so there's, but there's different methods. And, and here's the other cool thing about, about IPython notebooks. I'm like, oh, what is, what, what arguments does this guy take? Okay, you know, shift tab, right? And then I can get like this nice, oh, I see, it takes these three arguments, right? And here's the different ways I can use it. Um, so I definitely recommend, and it's called Jupyter Notebook now, but, but people have been using it for a while. I just call it IPython. Uh, I can also just plot this. So, um, you know, I want to look, so it says, okay, the entropy, the, the, you know, the correlation between entropy and query length is, uh, so, so exactly correlated is one, exactly anti-correlated is minus one, um, you know, not correlated at all is close to zero. So here it's saying, well, 0.78, you know, so reasonably highly correlated, right? So I can say, okay, well, here, here's my query length plotted against my entropy, you know, what does that look like, right? And, and there, and there does seem to be, you know, a reasonably high correlation. There's also kind of like this weird thing, like, whoa, what's that, right? So uh, here it's saying, okay, well, it's exactly the same query length, but then at these weird kind of like varying entropies, right? So, you know, uh, even though it seems kind of provincial, like, oh, I'm plotting my data, right? I mean, super useful, right? I kind of in a few lines of code, I've, I've brought in the log file, I've started plotting it, I've started 
uh, doing data analysis. And then, and then here I can say, okay, well, you know, show me like this little weird band here, like what is in here, right? Um, and I, so I can just do another filter and I could say, okay, well, kind of show me those query lengths and, and let me look at the data and figure out like, well, what, what, what's going on there? Um, so, so I can kind of make an arbitrary filter. So here I just said, you know, this condition and this condition. All right. Um, and then what, it was kind of like obvious, oh, these are PTR queries, they're all of this format, and then they just had different entropies. Um, so, that, so that was pretty easy, and so then I just, I just removed those, and then I plot it again, and that, that weird thing basically goes away. So a little bit of overkill, but I just wanted to give you a sense for how powerful data frames are. So you know, it seems like, oh, it's simple, you pull it into a data frame. But you know, there's a lot of power there, right, once you get it there. Okay. So any questions before I move on? All right. OK, so uh, the next bridge is pandas to scikit-learn. So uh, we showed how to go from, from, uh, from bro to, uh, to pandas, and now we're going to go from bro to scikit-learn. All right, uh, so for this demo, let's see here. So. And again, all of these are available on the GitHub, so you can you can go and look at the uh, at the at the. Uh, all right. Okay, so same kind of thing. I just I pull in the the, the log. I pull it into uh, to a data frame. Um, again, I'm, I make some kind of some operations. I'm interested in query length and some other parameters. Um, okay. So first thing to note here is if we look at these features, um, some of the features, you know, like query length uh, or things like Z, I mean, there'll be numerical features. Other features are Boolean features or categorical features, right? So my, my query type is going to be categorical. Uh, so, you know, it's going to be an A query or a text query or um, uh, Q class name, also categorical. So, uh, this can be kind of challenging to deal with. Like, so when I'm going to do machine learning and use scikit-learn, it has like these flat matrices, right? So it's just kind of these numerical matrices that are that are either re real values or zeros and ones. You know, how do I go from my my data frame to this matrix? Um, and so we have this really nice class. Uh, so in addition to kind of this nice class that pushes it into a data frame, we have this other class that takes the data frame and pushes it into a scikit-learn matrix. Um, and again, this is a NumPy array, so, so not, you can use it for other things besides scikit-learn. Um, so it's called a transformer, and, uh, and that's the terminology used by scikit-learn. Um, uh, so here I just take the data frame, uh, and I and I convert it to a matrix, and it and like all kinds of wonderful things happen. Um, I could literally spend uh, an entire hour on this class just because it's fairly complicated, but it'll do things like it'll detect categorical types for you. It'll go and say, oh, well, there's only you know five unique values in this column. I'm going to mark that as a categorical type, and then I'm going to do what's called one-hot encoding. And so it's a little bit kind of in the weeds and deep, but for categorical types, uh, what you want to do is you want to do, make these bit vectors, and then you know if I'm if I'm this value, then I'm a zero zero one zero zero, right? And and you 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 kind of make a new column for each possible value, and it's and it's a way of avoiding the mistake that people can make by encoding categorical types as kind of like integers and saying, well, I'm going to take you know if it's an A query, I'm going to call it one, and if it's a text query, I'm going to call it two, and if it's you know, a, a SVR query, I'm going to call it three. That can be very dangerous from a machine learning perspective because you're implying that one is more related to two than it is to five or six. Um, so what you really want to do is this thing called one-hot encoding. Um, it all, and it also takes care of, of normalization for you. So you basically just throw the data frame into this class and it, it kind of like properly prepares that NumPy array for you. So that's overkill. The, the, but in practice, if you, if you ever do this for real, um, the other thing that uh, can bite you is what I call silent but deadlies. 
So um, there are all these issues around how you encode this matrix, and because the matrix has no provenance, you don't, I mean, you know, it's just, it's just a flat matrix, right? I don't know that column six is supposed to in indicate this or that. So for instance, if I had a training set that, that, uh, that didn't have, I don't know, the trace HTTP method in it, right? But had all the rest of the methods. Um, and then, and then my evaluation set had the trace method in it. Boom! Either your your software crashes, or worse, the the sixth column now becomes the indicator for this unknown trace method, and your machine model uh, doesn't work at all, and you have no idea why, and it's completely silent. So uh, this class, if you're gonna do, if you're gonna get into this at all. Uh, at, at a minimum, understand what this class does for you. So you can serialize it, so you can just take this class, uh, pickle it, and then when you do evaluations, you just unpickle it, and it takes care, it manages all those columns for you. If I see a new column that I don't, that I've never seen before, it'll flag that, um, it'll handle all the, the, the right normalizations. So, okay. All right, so, so now that I've done that one line of code, uh, we're ready for scikit-learn. So I take my, my bro matrix, which is the output, I can send it through k-means, I can send it, so k-means is a clustering algorithm, PCA, uh, principal component analysis, basically will look at kind of the, the it'll look at the, the eigenvectors and eigenvalues, and basically will kind of project uh, kind of, okay, here are the, the two principal components uh, uh, that, that if I project against those components, uh, those, those those encode the most variance. I mean, and these are all details, but the idea is I can use PCA to do dimensionality reduction. So if I have like 12 dimensional data and I wanna project down to two dimensions, um, I can use PCA for that. Okay, and then I can just take the results of those machine learning algorithms and then add them as columns back to my data frame. So that's really powerful actually. So I just say, okay, take PCA, you know, dimension zero, call that X, you know, take the k-means result, call that cluster, right? And then I, I pop it out, um, and, then, and then here I go. I have, I have that back in my data frame. Um, and so then I can do things like plot, right? So, so here, again, we've only projected to two dimensions, so you'll see some kind of overlap in these clusters. Um, but, you know, in a few lines of code, I've taken kind of these complicated machine learning algorithms I've, I've run them against my row data, and then I've plotted them, right? And, and, you know, we can do all kinds of cool things. And in fact, for live demos, we might as well kind of like mix it up and try to make something crash. So uh, for PCA, you know, I don't really need to just create uh, two dimensions. I can create three or four or five. Let's do four. And then here, uh, this is kind of a hack. So I can say, well, since some of my stuff overlapped, uh, let's take the first component and the second component, add that. All right, let's see now. What is that? Hey, look, there it goes. So, so I, I just kind of randomly took one of those principal component dimensions and then added that to, to one of my, my plotting dimensions. And now the clusters that are in kind of like this higher dimensional space now project kind of more cleanly to this lower dimensional space. The other thing I can do is like, okay, well, how did I know that, that, you know, I have five clusters. Wow, you got lucky. You know, uh, you know what, if I, what if you did four clusters? Um, so let's do four clusters. All right. So uh, what's going to happen in this plot? Who can, who can tell me what's going to happen with four clusters? Nobody cares. All right. Uh, so two clusters became one cluster. So t this, th this used to be a little purple blob here. And since it was close to that green blob, it then became all one green blob. Um, now, if you're interested in, in like how you how you actually know how many clusters to have, uh, we have a we have a notebook on that. Um, okay, so now the little purple blob is back. All right. Um, so let's look at those five clusters. All right. So uh, here, uh, this this is. You know, this is toy data. I, I wanted something that people could experiment with, download. You know, you want to download a repo that doesn't have a ton of data in it. Um, but I'm going to call this the normal cluster. So there were 42 observations in the normal cluster. In cluster one, there were three observations, and they have 
these dashes. And I'm actually not a Bro expert, so I don't know why Bro was putting those dashes in for those things. I don't know if it's just something where they can't, couldn't find the information. Uh, but that, that basically the cluster is saying, you know, I'm, I'm clustering these because these all have dashes, right? Um, the next cluster is because it, it's the TCP prototype uh, protocol instead of UDP. Uh, the, the next cluster is because the reserve Z bit was set to one for whatever reason. That should be set to zero. I think, I think there's some protocols that abuse DNS and actually set that to one. And then, and then the last cluster was the super long, crazy uh, DNS queries. Um, now the thing to note here is like numerical types, categorical types, it all just got thrown into the mix and then clustered, right? And so that, that's actually pretty powerful. All right, so that was uh, maybe a little bit long, but hopefully, hopefully useful. Okay, um, let's see, how am I doing on time? Ten minutes. All right. Uh, so let's see. The anomaly detection. You know, I, I might kind of just breeze through that and kind of just kind of like, hey, here's what, here's what we do. And then if people are interested, uh, people can go look at the notebook. Uh, again, it's all just GitHub bat. Um, all right. So uh, anomaly detection. So people have kind of these popular kind of misconceptions about anomaly detection. Like, oh, look, you know, I got this big spike. I can see it. Um, uh, you know, and one of the misconceptions is that it's going to show you something bad, right? And, and of course that's not true. It's just showing you something that's uncommon, right? So, so anomaly detection is really just breaking things up into here's the things that were common and here were the, were the things that were uncommon. And so we like to uh, kind of call it base camp. So I, I find that when people experiment with anomaly detection, there's kind of this roller coaster. Like, they're like, woohoo, I'm going to do an anomaly detection. And they run it on a million rows, and then they get 10,000 rows out. And then they're like visually scanning the 10,000 rows, and they're saying, why are these anomalous, right? And then they're sad because they realize that their big pile of data just became a small pile, but still a pile. Um, and so, so we call anomaly detection kind of just base camp. It's like, okay. I mean, you can, you, can, you can get a helicopter ride to base camp. It's like 3,500 bucks. Um, so it really is just, all you're really doing with anomaly detection is you're just filtering out the common. So in a big data pipeline, all you're really doing is just saying, okay, cool. I'm going to call that common. And then now I'm going to do kind of like further processing and analysis on the uncommon. Um, okay. And so we have this little pyramid here. Right, so raw network traffic, you take out the common, you have anomalous, and then you organize the anomalous into interesting, and then you even have this little top tiny pyramid that says, okay, you know, with enough work, maybe that's potentially malicious. Um, okay, so uh, what, does this, what does this pyramid look like? So we go, from, we go from bro data to data frame to matrix conversions. I just covered those two classes. Um, we run what's called uh, isolation forest. So isolation forest is extremely uh, efficient and handles high dimensional data really well. Um, and then and we use that for our anomaly detection. Okay. And, and what that gets, so this is how isolation forest works. So it's just kind of the spatial dividing algorithm. And the idea here is that, is that in order to get a point by itself, if I have to do a lot of divisions, then it's in a crowded space. Um, if I have to do relatively few di divisions to get that point by itself, then it's in a space that doesn't have a lot of neighbors. Um, and so it just builds this gigantic kind of tree-like, multi-dimensional multi tree-like structure. Um, and, then, and then you can kind of tune it. And you can say, oh, OK, well, show me the 1% anomalous data. And it'll show you kind of the top 1%. Um, and that's, that's how we use it, is, is we literally just say, okay, 99% of the data just mark as common, and then we're going to do further analysis on the top 1%. All right, and then uh, once you get there, once you get to base camp, then that's where kind of like the interesting work happens. So what we do is like, okay, again, we, I, you know, I've seen this before and I've done it myself. When you have that 1%, you're looking through the rows as a human, and you're like, well, why are these anomalous? You only want those organized for you. Like, okay, cool. 
these are anomalies, now organize them for me, kind of categorize them for me, you know, narrate them for me, say, you've got this, this, and this, and immediately you can, you can kind of say, oh, well, that's our web dev cluster making weird HTTP uh, requests, or, hmm, that's interesting, you know, mark for, mark for uh, future, future investigation. Um, and so we do clustering on the anomalous stuff. Okay, so uh, probably not enough time to go into that, but uh, it, you know, basically it's the same thing you saw before. We go from bro log to data frame to, to, to matrix, and then we run uh, two, two scikit-learn algorithms on it, and, and we're good to go. All right, so uh, I got five minutes left. So, so this is kind of a cool one. So Broda Kafka to Spark. Uh, I want to give a, a big shout out to uh, J John Ziola. Um, he, uh, he's from the Metron project and he helped me with the Spark plugin and kind of made it cool. All right, so uh, let me show you what, what so I, got, I have Bro running. Um, hopefully this works. <laughs> so uh, the, the uh, Kafka plugin, you know, you just kind of, you know, there's instructions, so if you go, if you, you uh, let's see here. So da, da, da. If I go here, and I go to to Kafka to Spark. All right. Um, so it kind of tells you how to set up the, the plugin, and it's going to get a lot, a lot easier. So John said uh, he's got like the package, the Bro package, basically working. Um, but you basically kind of make these changes to your local .bro file, um, and and at least the plugin right now, you're ready to go. So, and then what I can do is, it's just sitting there emitting messages into this message queue. And so all I've done is I've just said, oh, I can listen into the messages, right? So this, you know, the queue is sitting there as a publisher, and then I can kind of subscribe from anywhere, right? So, so here, this is just kind of like a little command line. So I just subscribe to that. Um, and so let's, let's look at what that looks like from a notebook perspective. Uh, and again, notebooks are just Python code, so don't don't let the no notebooks scare you. Uh, so let's go to bro to Python to Kafka. All right. Um, so let's run this guy. Okay. So uh, as of July, when you pip install PySpark, uh, it will actually do this cool thing where if you give it a local uh, uh, um, master. It'll spin up a local PySpark server for you. So literally, installing Spark now on your laptop has become pip install PySpark. It's awesome. All right, so we Spark it here. Um, so this guy, I'm saying local four. So this will actually spin up four uh, Spark executors. Um, and this is kind of this line of code took me two days to figure out. By the way. This is how you load the jar file to get uh, Spark to run the, the Kafka plugin. Um, and this is how, I mean, you can do it from config or environmental variables or whatever, but I wanted to do it from, from, from this, the, the notebook here. So we run that up. Uh, it'll take a little while because it's back there kind of setting up uh, Spark. And so if we go and we look at localhost 4040, you can actually see, like, okay, we, you know, we actually have Spark running. It's actually running these these four jobs, and the, and it kind of seems silly, like, oh, you're running a local, you're running Spark on your laptop. I don't know, my laptop has four cores. Uh, I like, you know, I can test stuff out, right? So I might as well use my four cores, um, and and certainly it's kind of cool to be able to run stuff locally before I deploy it. So we use we use Databricks. I, I don't, not affiliated, but they're great. Uh, so if you use Databricks. You can kind of like spin up these EC2 clusters and it'll have Spark already for it. Um, I definitely recommend. Uh, okay, so enough about that. Um, so uh, one, one more pitch, uh, Apache Arrow is gonna be awesome. Uh, it's kind of still coming online, but it's this whole kind of in-memory column R storage thing. Uh, and you can kind of go from all these different kind of language barriers and toolkits. Uh, so here we can say Spark enable Arrow and it'll actually do these kind of optimized uh, memory feeds. So this is what our Spark pipeline looks like. So this is kind of cool because it's, it's a nice decoupling, right? So you can run Bro, you run Kafka Publish, you know, you just run the plugin, and that, you know, one guy sets that up, 
right? And then, and then whoever else is interested in these messages, just from whatever machine, you know, I can, I can just, I can, I can subscribe to, you know, bro messages uh, server, and then I can run my, my own pipeline here uh, just as a, as a subscriber, right? So let's, let's see what that looks like. So here, uh, so, so Spark has this whole kind of new streaming architecture associated with it. Um, so here I can, so here, I don't know if people are familiar with Spark, but typically you do like Spark read. Here you do Spark read stream. Um, and so then I read stream. Uh, there's this little bit of kind of goofy, hard-coded schema thing here. But uh, and what we'll do with, with BAT is you'll just, you'll, you kind of just call something like, say, it'll say like DNS schema or something. Anyway, so you set up the schema, uh, you set up these, the part of that pipeline, so that pipeline had like ETL and, and then filtering and, and then data analysis. So I'm setting up my ETL pipeline, I'm setting up my filtering, uh, I can print kind of the output of that. So here's the, the other cool thing about Spark. So, I mean, you have this pipeline running on the server, right, and the server can be anywhere. Um, as long as you're kind of like aggregating data and you're doing and you're kind of like reducing that the size of that funnel, um, you can pull back some of the data to the client. So here I can actually write the end of the stream back to my in-memory uh, client. So so this is now a so here it's a Spark streaming query, um, and this is kind of an in-memory table, right? So here it's not very exciting because I just I just now like subscribed to it and started the pipeline going. So you know, that pipeline just started executing now, right? So so all the ETL and so now if I if I hit return again, oop, slightly bigger, right? Um, and it's because my bro instance is running on my laptop and actually feeding that pipeline in the background, right? So you know, I don't have that that much stuff going on on my laptop, but you know, I don't know, Stack Overflow. Oops, I can't spell. Okay, sure. Uh, so let me just wrap this up, and then and then we'll be done. All right, come on. Yeah, all right, four. All right. So so this is basically just like aggregating, like okay, for this IP address and this query type name, give me a count, right? So so that that was it. I mean, you know, and this and this little pipeline will just sit here and execute all day long. All right. So time for questions. Okay, thanks.